very nice to see you here. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, to this uh, third week of uh, our MBA summit, we start this week with our parallel sessions on very interesting topics. Today we start with science fiction uh, track with the science fiction track. Uh, we hope it's also something important and uh, relevant for for your view of uh, how business will be conducted not only today but in the future. Um, today we have Nicolas um, that who will speak about the view of uh, how can we take some ideas of science fiction into shaping uh, future strategies for, for our society and companies. Uh, so thank you everyone. Um, I hope you can also join us uh, during the week in the different topics you have the agenda and hopefully it will be a very fruitful uh, week for you. Tamara, thank you very much for being here again with us. And I pass the, the microphone to you. Thank you, Tamara. Thank you. Well, I am delighted to welcome longtime colleague and friend, Nicholas Nova. You'll see a little bit more about his bio highlights, but a few notes that I'd like to share in advance. One, Nicholas is dialing in from Switzerland. He heads up the Near Future Laboratory, and I thought he could bring some interesting stories about his work both at the lab, but also with some academic roles that he has helping to research, write, document, and understand the way people think about future culture. And he sits right at that intersection of culture, interaction design, and futures research in a really fascinating way. Now, we invite all your questions as you hear Nicholas talk, so please don't hesitate drop them in the chat window of Zoom, and I'll be monitoring them as Nicholas chats, and then we could dive into these questions at the end of his talk. So please join me in welcoming Nicholas, and we have a short video to share. So hi everyone, nice to meet you here on Zoom. I'm, uh, I'm in Geneva, Switzerland, it's the afternoon. So good morning for you, good afternoon for, <laughs> for me. Uh, thank you for having me here. So the, the, I mean, the general uh, theme of this, of this presentation that I wanna give is about like a sort of a cousin or parallel uh, notion to science fiction, which is design fiction. And I introduce that uh, in a minute. Uh, the work that I'm going to show here is based on, the, on my practice, uh, the studio called the Near Future Laboratory, which is based in Europe and in California, uh, in Geneva and Madrid and uh, San Francisco and, and Los Angeles. And it's um, a research studio we founded like now 15 years ago with my, uh, my colleagues. And what I want to do in this uh, presentation is to go from case studies, start with the uh, some of the project we, we've done around design fiction to give you a definition of what it is and what it means in terms of uh, conducting business. Uh, a little bit of history, how it uh, came into being. That's probably more the academic side of my brain uh, talking. And then the uh, how to approach and the approach, the process so that I can conclude with some of the, some of the key points to uh, take home and probably uh, uh, that we can discuss afterwards. So, I mean, starting from case studies, just to give you some, uh, some kind of perspective on the sort of project we are doing with design fiction and science fiction. This is a list, uh, I, I just made like, this very basic kind of list of the topics that uh, we've been uh, working on in the last 15 years or so. Uh, it's, as you can see, it's mostly related with certain kinds of technologies, 
could be digital technologies, network technologies, and and overall that's how we uh, I mean we built our uh, practice and our reputation. It's not that we are not interested in other kind of, uh, but I mean social change or like uh, like geopolitical changes and, and and things like that. It's mostly because we are focused on uh, technologies. So in in general, companies, private companies, and public organizations they came they came to us. Uh, with some kind of expectation that we can help them because we can help them to understand how certain technologies may have an influence on their business, may uh, lead, to them, lead them to ask certain questions. Like for each of the technologies that, that are described in the background, they, might they may wonder about what would be the user experience of car sharing systems in the future? Uh, what would be the user experience of gestural interfaces, home automation devices, uh, would their customer accept these technologies, how they would adapt to it, uh, how these technologies may affect their organization and probably also the, 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 the business partners they work on. And eventually the, the general question they always ask is, what, what kind of products and services may appear based on those technologies. So that's, I mean, that, that's very general and it's probably a bit weird for, for some of you, but it's, it's always like that. I mean, the other day I, I received a, a, an email, like some kind of like, like it was not like a, a, a project, but this, the beginning of a discussion for a, a project. And it was exactly about that, the same kind of uh, template. And I, I think it's interesting to start with this in this kind of presentation to tell you, yeah, that's what we're working on. That's the kind of questions we, we address. And what do we do with that? What we do is to, uh, we are like in between design, technology, and culture. What we do is to create scenarios about the future of technologies uh, that, that have a certain uh, shape, a certain format. And we call this design fiction uh, in the sense that what we try to do is to make potential futures look real so that the clients we work with can understand the complexities, the nuances, the problems they may be confronted with, understand their opportunities and threats. And in order to do that, we create fictional objects that can visually uh, and using several media express those scenarios so that the clients can understand how you go from artificial intelligence or car sharing systems or social media, how this may change uh, in the reality, in uh, everyday life, in the future. So, I mean, uh, the, the first project we worked on, like probably 15 years ago, were kind of a bit more tongue in cheek and probably funny project in which we tried to show how we can start from a big technological change at the time, web 2.0, social media. And what we did was to create a series of objects that would make the people we work with understand like the consequences of those technologies. Like for instance, taking like the changes that may appear with the social media platforms such as Twitter and turning it into scratching cards so that we make the clients at the time were absolutely unaware of these things and not really taking that seriously. We created this kind of devices. Um, more serious project that we did uh, recently, and it's probably uh, it's more serious in the sense that uh, this, the previous one was more like some kind of joke that we, we used to do this kind of things at the beginning to, to uh, build our practice. But that's a project we did uh, last year for the Department of Mobility of the, the state of Geneva uh, in Switzerland. So the state of Geneva is one of the many uh, uh, states in the small federal uh, confederation uh, in, in Switzerland. And they asked us to build uh, something that could generate a public debate about the future of mobility in the in the city, and they were interested in uh, automation and car sharing uh, systems and self driving vehicles uh, in a way that they would they would be interested in engaging uh, the population in a, in an understanding of how those technologies might affect and might change uh, mobility patterns. So what we did at the time was to uh, wonder about what kind of artifact may exist in the near future that would 
make the people in Geneva understand what it is to, to, to live in a city where you have this kind of technologies. And what we like to do, and that's what my colleague uh, Nick Foster called future mundane, what we like to do is to create very mundane and banal kind of scenarios that make people understand how certain changes can impact them. And what we did was to imagine that in the near future, there could be a service uh, that when, whenever you arrive at the airport, you get uh, a sort of card with a barcode that can help you uh, open a car sharing uh, system with self-driving vehicles. And you use that to enter the car as a kind of registration uh, ticket, but also the card as a map. And, and the map is a good way to help you engage uh, into uh, an understanding with where you can go with your self-driving vehicle, where you cannot go, where it might be tricky. Um, so we use this very, very basic format, the, the map, the, the sort of public uh, transit map as a way to, well, describe some elements of the scenarios about the near future we wanted to uh, bring a debate to the population. So in the map, you can see that there are different colors that explain that uh, the further you go in the city center, uh, the more you have to use self driving vehicle, which we call op optimized traffic. When you're on the outskirts of Geneva, you can use mixed traffic, self driving vehicles and, and normal uh, vehicles. Uh, we imagine like a different kind of uh, signage for places where streets are so narrow that the GPS signals would be too low. So uh, it would be difficult to drive with a self-driving vehicle and et cetera, et cetera. I won't, I won't comment everything on this map, but the point was to create an object that feels a little bit from now, a little bit from the future so that people would not be too, not feel too weird about, about what it is, but they would understand what it means practically. And we organized then a series of workshop and debate where people could like uh, you, use the map or look at the map and ask them questions about their uh, mobility patterns and how this would change it. And it helped them eventually to understand how these things might have an influence on their uh, daily, uh, daily life. And then, come up with certain, uh, certain remarks or comments about what they'd like to have or what they don't, would not like to have in terms of mobility uh, services in the car, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and one last example uh, is this project that we did with this uh, Swedish uh, company, furniture company that I guess you, you know of, uh, IKEA. And again, here, we, we, what we were interested in at the time, it was in 2014, we were interested in showing IKEA the consequences of networked technologies, the Internet of Things, uh, network object, and how this would have an influence on the product they sell and how they might have to react in a way that they do not have like uh, complete competitors doing it uh, uh, on the side. So what we did was to use the one of the most common uh, uh, example of design fiction format we use, which are catalogs. And obviously ITI is a good candidate because uh, I, I've been told that the uh, ITI catalog is so, so distributed that it's even more distributed than the Bible, uh, which, is, which is kind of crazy. And I think now they will, they will soon they will stop and they will move online. But at the time, they, they, they had good faith into this uh, sort of paper-based version, and we did the uh, uh, digital version as well. And I won't like, present like many projects, but what we did practically was to start from technological trends about uh, sensors, uh, sensor-based technologies, automation, machine learning, AI. And what we tried to do was to turn those technologies into examples of products that would show IKEA what it would mean practically for the line of business. So for instance, like a bed, a bed is a very basic example that exists, that's been uh, around for quite some time in humanity. But what we tried to do was to use the language of IKEA, the way they present, describe their uh, product and, and turn that into something that is fictional. Uh, and, and, and here, the idea was basically to show that uh, their product could become services and what it means practically when you have a bed that becomes a service can be illustrated by the pricing, by the notion that your sleeping preferences could be, uh, I mean, you can, fall, you can 
move them, transfer them from one bed to another, uh, that there could be some like characteristics that we describe with some visual uh, icons about uh, the fact that it should be connected. So it should require some kind of infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. And again, I mean, I'm not necessarily in favor of this kind of technology. I, 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 I'm, I'm more interested in creating these things so that they can create a debate with potential consumers and uh, the consumers of IKEA product, but also a, a, an important debate in the company itself because designing and manufacturing this kind of object is not a given. It, it requires to uh, reshape the, 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 the process and the way they uh, bring different supply chains uh, uh, in, their, in, their, in their project. So this kind of object is very, an, an object, I mean, the, this kind of catalog, this kind of fictional catalog is a very low key, low tech way to uh, illustrate potential scenarios about the near future in order to engage into a certain kind of conversation about things that could be very abstract for, for the client we, we work with, like machine learning sensors, uh, AI, all those technologies that, that in our experience, they, they're discussed by like the, the people we work with, but sometimes there's no clear definition. Sometimes there's no alignment about what it is. So creating those like little object is a way to make things uh, a bit more uh, like uh, structured. Um, so perhaps uh, another uh, definition now that I've presented some, some examples. So for us, design fiction, it's a bit like science fiction, except that you, you, don't, you don't do the movie, you don't produce the movie, you produce only the objects. You design, that's where the design part is, fictional artifacts that illustrates potential scenarios uh, that do as if those products already exist so that we can uh, engage into discussions about innovation and uh, looking for opportunities or uh, threats. And I mean, over time, we tend to uh, specialize into using very standard object and media conventions like fake product catalogs, map of fictional areas, or map of real areas that projected in the future, fictional newspapers, uh, we used to do like videos about things in the future. We used to uh, use a lot of digital technologies, but eventually over time, we realized that there is value in creating this uh, tangible artifact that we can circulate in workshops, that can, we can annotate uh, things on like the map that I've presented uh, before. And the whole thing about design fiction is that it's if you, if you followed classes about like futures research and foresight uh, methodologies, for us, thinking about scenarios in the future with a, cert a certain format in mind, like a map, like a, a product catalog, is a way to think about different dimensions in the futuring process that is important. And I get back to that uh, a bit later. So where does this come from? That's a question you may wonder about. So of course, there's a connection with science fiction, but prior to that, I wanna remember you that there's been, I mean, in, in humanity and in a lot of like cultures, uh, art was used to project oneself in the future. And I like showing this example. I'm, I'm, I'm French and Swiss, and this is a, like, a, 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 like an illustration that you used to see in books as a, as a French kid. It's called La Sortie de l'Opéra, the exit of the opera. Uh, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century by Albert Robida was an artist whose job was to produce this kind of visual representation about how the future could be. And it used to create these things. You can see flying cars and, and, and things that stayed after, after him uh, in um, uh, futuring uh, images. So of course, art and science fiction in the 20th century was an important way to uh, create stories, uh, objects, uh, artifacts like fanzines, magazines, uh, to give some insights about how the future could be. And, and I mean, if, you, if you've seen, like the, the, if you're interested in science fiction, it's quite intriguing to see how the beginning of science fiction was, I mean, it used to be called science fiction, was so, some kind of like a, a, a di direct trajectory or projection from science insights to fictional account that would uh, help people 
dream or be afraid of, of technology and, and based on stories and the power of stories is important. But in those stories, there were always artifacts that were presented, the power of representing visually or with text, how certain artifacts, big machines uh, could, could, was very uh, important in science fiction as a more uh, entertainment uh, way of seeing things. And approximately at the same time, uh, designers were uh, asked to contribute to similar kind of projection in the future. And, and this is what you have here is a very interesting example from um, uh, a designer, it used to be a, a theatrical uh, designer, Norman Belgiris, who was asked by uh, the General Motors company at the World Fair in 1939 in the US to build something that would make uh, the, the people visiting the, the fair understanding how the future of cities would be. And people were making these huge lines in the pavilion, enter the pavilions and see this, the, the map of New York with the skyscrapers and the roads and, and, and traffic and a new kind of transit system. And then people would go out and they would get a pin that said, uh, I've seen the future, I have it somewhere. I could not find it for this presentation, but uh, that, that was some kind of interesting uh, experience that was created here. And that's what designers do. They create experience by creating artifacts and a context in which certain things may happen. And here, of course, General Motors was interested in showing a potential path in the future so that they could also shape their business uh, around it. And I don't wanna spend too much time on the history, but uh, the previous example was in the, like the domain of like private companies. Uh, but of course, uh, like uh, also people uh, like architects, designers wanted also to reappropriate re their, their futures in the 60s and use the same kind of tools, created mock-up, fanzines, artifacts that would show potential uh, possibilities in the future. Here it's the British uh, architecture uh, studio Archigram who created a lot of, they, they never built anything. What they, what they did was to create fictional artifact to make people understand that there could be alternatives to the city of the 60s, and that could be walking cities, which were, of course, provocation. So that, that was in the 90s, this, this kind of um, uh, speculative kind of uh, architecture and design was uh, reused or was kind of like, like as if it was born again. There was a, a renewed interest in those things because of digital technologies and the ICT uh, revolution in the 90s. And you had people like Anthony Dunn and Fiona uh, designers from the Royal College of Art in London who created artifacts to make us understand the consequences of those digital technologies. And, and it's called, I mean, it, you might see that in a science fiction movie, but what it did was to create that for museums or cultural centers. And at the time, like 1994, they created this series of object furnitures uh, with Faraday cage so that the um, uh, electromagnetic wave will not uh, come in. And if you have a cell phone, like people started having cell phones in the mid 90s, you could be protected and you could uh, be uh, quiet and not be annoyed by uh, your friend, your family, your boss or whatever. So what they did at the time was to create objects to engage people in understanding some dramatic consequences of technologies. And, and it's, again, it's a bit similar to what I've presented before. It's creating objects without necessarily the the, the, the narrative, the story, like you would find it in a science fiction movie. The idea is that the object speaks for itself. Uh, because you, I mean, if you see that it's called Faraday chair and you see uh, this, probably you understand that it's what it is and you react to it. Uh, of course, I mean, I continue my story here. Of course, this was quite common uh, later on. If you read Wired Magazine, and in the last pages of Wired Magazine, there's always this, artifacts from the future uh, page that plays on the same kind of idea. Here you have like the idea of how certain kind of 3D printing technologies, this, this one does not exist yet, but how certain kind of uh, 3D printing technologies might uh, be helpful for people in the future, for instance, by helping you create your uh, basketball or your soccer ball or football 
Um, I mean, that, that, that was one of the examples that I think I, I was quite um, fascinated with at the, at the end of the 90s and beginning of the 21st century, to see the, the power, the evocation of how uh, like this kind of illustration could encapsulate many ideas from trend reports, from uh, scientific discoveries and, and, and new technologies. And of course, if you're in the, you, you work in the car industry, you know that there are many kind of uh, format to create narratives about future products. Concept car is one, uh, but here I might say that it's slightly different because the idea is not necessarily to engage into a critical discussion about how technology might change the world, but it's also an interesting way to see how designers can, uh, well, contribute to discussions about how the future might be. But perhaps the most interesting examples you all familiar with is science fiction, science fiction TV shows or movies or comic books. The, the way science fiction uh, directors and producers use certain ways to make you believe that a technology works, like in, in Black Mirror, it's probably one of the most interesting case of engage, engaging you into believing that the technology exists and then you understand its consequences. That's, I mean, that's probably also like part of this like family of notion of design, fiction, speculative design, and basically the way designing artifacts can be a way to engage a group of people into discussing the problems, the opportunities, the good sides, the bad side of technological change. Um, now, I mean, I, I, you might wonder about, okay, but how do you do that? I mean, it's, uh, it's uh, all good and nice, but practically when you receive those questions that I've presented at the beginning, what's, what's the approach? What's the, what's the process? So here, I, I just to give you a, a like an example of how we work and, it's, and, and to translate that into the language of uh, futures research and strategic foresight. Obviously what, what we do most of the time is to, I mean, we don't necessarily go straight to designing something. What we do is to start from a mix of desk research and field research in which we collect examples of, of weak signals, of signals of potential change, which are not so frequent nowadays, but might become more uh, frequent or important. So let's say for instance, we'd be work, we, could, we work on uh, the future of food, a big, big uh, uh, topic. And one of the topics that is quite, quite important about future of food is protein, uh, because obviously uh, it's problematic to, uh, uh, to consume too much meat uh, and that for, for the planet. So there could be alternatives. So what we did in the project was to collect many examples of uh, reports, uh, experts, uh, interviews, and a lot of documents about what it means to, uh, to, to use protein as a, as a source of uh, something that could be uh, good for your body, that can be uh, important to give you <laughs> enough uh, energy, and also that could be not too problematic for, for the planet. So what we did was to collect the those, those material, we discuss those things, it's a little project, we don't spend too much time on it, but we do that for a few days. And after a while, we start noticing like different patterns. For instance, there is the uh, economic side of the, uh, insect protein business that could be interesting. There's the discussion around GMO and insects uh, uh, production that could be, I don't, I'm not necessarily in favor of all of this. Uh, I say that uh, one more time, but it's the kind of discussion that evolved around like insect proteins around uh, like 2018. So about where the food industry is, which uh, cultures or which uh, territories could produce uh, like insect uh, based protein. So we notice these different patterns. And after that, we come up with the idea of, okay, how do we, how do we tell the story? How do we make people understand what uh, insect proteins would be in the future so that we want them to react? And here, the, the, again, in, in the, if you remember a few minutes ago, I mentioned the fact that we work with future mundane uh, uh, like representation. We try to find very mundane and banal kind of representation. And what is more mundane than a, a box of cereal? 
So what we do is to choose this, this like uh, very basic object, uh, the box of cereal, and try to see how to design a box of cereal that would make people understand what it means to have like this, this kind of uh, food uh, based on, on insects. So we create the box. I mean, that's how the design uh, skills come, comes in handy. Uh, we create the box with all those kinds of little details that can be used later on to make people react, to engage people we work with, to understand like, the, the opportunities, the limits, the problems, the uh, possibilities about, for instance, uh, where this would come from. So probably, I mean, we, 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 we made this up. We, we put it, this product as a product of Korea, but it could be uh, someplace else. It's just that we in the, we noticed in the weak signal part that Korea uh, had like uh, boosted its um, a kind of um, uh, companies producing this kind of uh, of, uh, of food. Uh, we realized that JMO would play an important role in there, so we put some kind of label uh, certification labels and all of those little details that make this kind of object credible and plausible for the people we, we work with. So the idea again is to start from what you know and extrapolate so that we create an object that people can, can understand. One more example to, uh, to go back to the, the process so that you understand more concretely. Uh, another client question that we work on uh, in the near future, how will normal everyday people would operate self-driving vehicles? self-driving vehicles, we, in the discussion, we, we, I mean, we, we noticed that with the company we work with, it, it was a typical example of some kind of like potential technology that would change everything. But a lot of people in the discussion we participated in were not really precise about what it was practically. Is it like the individual car that is that has some kind of self-driving capabilities? Is it some kind of uh, shuttle for uh, groups of people in public transport, et cetera, et cetera. So what we did was to uh, start working with this uh, topic with a research phase in which we started becoming interested in new habits, new rituals, new behaviors about our interaction with cars uh, today. It was a project that we did in around 2013 and 14. So we spent time with people using car sharing system like Zipcar, uh, spending time also with people who started uh, using uh, these technologies. And one good way to do that is to look at the literature. Uh, uh, that's where desk research could be super useful to understand that uh, there are many, many projects that have been uh, focused on automated vehicle, and there's a lot of material about the human computer interaction of it, the problems, the limits, the, the opportunities. So we use that uh, material uh, as, as weak signals. We spend sometimes also uh, in uh, Europe and in the US uh, trying different kinds of self-driving vehicles, which were uh, already uh, happening. This one is in Lausanne on the Swiss Institute of Technology campus. So it was a way to understand the, the usage, the context, how it changes signage, how it changes the way like people who pass by might be affected by the vehicle. And we collected all those uh, weak signals about uh, self-driving uh, vehicle. And what we did after, afterwards was to uh, create a group of, uh, of people. We did a workshop in San Francisco uh, at the uh, IXDA Interaction Conference uh, in 2014, in which we asked the group of designers, science fiction writers, and engineers to digest the weak signals we uh, collected and to come up with, uh, I would say, nine or 10 potential problems of self caused by self-driving vehicles as a, as, a, as a user, if you are a user for self-driving vehicles. And the groups, after a few hours, came up with this, this series of different uh, problems, like what happened if you lost and you don't know where to go and how to control the self-driving vehicle, how to upgrade the system, what happens when you uh, like uh, rented or you gave the, the self-driving vehicle to Uber and you want to get it back. So one of the group imagined that there would be some kind of hailing 
operating uh, system, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And and here, what you have in in the in the workshop is a way the group managed to transfer the problems they identified with potential. I would not say solutions, but, but potential issues in terms of user experience. And what we asked the groups afterwards was to create an object, a design fiction that would make this experience understandable for people. And what we did was to, to use a, a very uh, basic kind of uh, format. Uh, I mean, when you, when you buy a, a smartphone in general, it's, it, you have this kind of quick start guide uh, that is, that is uh, sold with it. It's not like the big, a manual that we used to have like uh, uh, in the past, but it's the most important things you have to know if you use a smartphone. So what we did was to create exactly this. Uh, and the, the client was not Amazon, it's just we use that as a, as a sort of placeholder. Um, so what if we could transform this kind of uh, description of scenarios about the user experience of self driving vehicle into uh, this kind of quick stop guide? And it's, it's, uh, it's a very, I mean, again, it's very low tech, paper-based, very basic as a way to uh, illustrate potential problems that exist, potential solution that may be put in place by companies who would uh, uh, manufacture the system. But our point was not to invent potential solution in the future. Our point was to use that with the clients we work with uh, we used to work with Renault, the French Renault Nissan, the French Japanese car maker, uh, to engage them into discussion about what it would mean practically uh, in seven years, in five years, in three years, next year, to imagine those features present in the car and how they would have to uh, design things differently, how they would have probably to create a new kind of process, and and all those things that I present here are not. The point is not to say, this is the future, it's our prediction, things gonna be like that. No, it's a way to make discussions today about how to design for next year, in three years, in five years, in seven years, more accurate, more precise. And of course, the hypothesis based on those things, but it's a way to be, to do better than saying, oh, the future is self driving vehicles and it's promising. That's not really helpful. What we wanna do is to be more uh, accurate into the discussion we have, into the workshops we have with the company or the clients. Um, so it's, this is basically the, the whole process and I'm reaching the end of my talk here. So the first part is what we call clarifying the presence, starting from an understanding of users, technologies, uh, companies, mapping the possibilities about uh, how change can happen. Uh, and it's done through desk research, uh, like reading patterns, lab reports, research papers, art projects sometimes because they can surprise us in a way that we're not expecting things, uh, expert interviews. So that's desk research. And field research is more, uh, it's closer to going on the field, like, like I'm also an anthropologist of technology. So it means that I spend time observing people, interviewing people, uh, participating into their daily activities to understand how things can change, especially if you spend some time with more extreme users, users of technology, which are certainly a bit more advanced than the norm. That's a way also to collect interesting weak signals. And those signals are, are then analyzed and used in with this kind of what if questions that we used in the examples that I presented. What if like you could like share your self-driving vehicle with Uber. What if uh, there's a, there are self-driving vehicles uh, in uh, Geneva and what it would mean for certain streets, for certain uh, boulevard and use that kind of analysis in conjunction with certain scenarios formats, scenario formats, like maps, like catalogs, manuals, uh, unboxing videos on YouTube. Uh, I mean, there are plenty of, of these things. We have a huge list of uh, format and use that to project and create speculative scenarios called design fiction. But the point is not, it's not like the end of the project. The end of the project is to use those scenarios to engage the clients into or the, the end users into discussions about the plausibility of the scenario, the relevance, uh, how this might have an influence on what they do now in a few years and what should be changed. So eventually, that's my last, uh, last time, 
why do we do that? I mean, why do we create those uh, little things that seems a bit like funny or seems a bit banal and mundane? Four reasons. The first one is to inform our clients uh, or help them anticipate new products and services by thinking about new possibilities and then going into the details of the technological changes that happen. Second reason is to build a new kind of organizational culture. Uh, like for instance, what we did with, with IKEA was a way to uh, show them that shifting from product to services because of technology required some, some cultural change. And of course, it's not just us telling that to them. There are whole uh, groups of uh, consultants and companies helping them on this. But it's a way, we tend to think that creating this object is a way to make the clients understand that a bit more uh, directly. Third reason, uh, using those artifacts, it's a way to build a vision, to communicate this vision, to debate about its vision, and not saying, okay, oh, yeah, the future and our vision is about AI or machine learning, which is so general that we going to do everything with that. That's a way to go at the deeper level and try to understand what it would mean practically for a city, a company to use uh, artificial intelligence. And, and last point, and I think it's key to mention that at the end, is the point is not to like create science, science sci-fi or science fiction scenario. The point is to use that to go back to today and to build a new vision, to build priorities, to help the client make a preferable future attainable so that it's not, it's not too uh, abstract and uh, general. And this is just like a, a book we're working on with my colleague in the near future laboratory too. That would probably say everything that I said here, but in a, a, a much uh, longer uh, way, probably a bit uh, in a thoughtful way uh, with a lot of examples. Thank you very much. Nicholas, this was so interesting and spot on in terms of our event theme around strategic foresight and futures thinking. And then, of course, diving into the special track for using science fiction as a lens on business. And so many of you uh, may have questions. And since we have an intimate forum here with Zoom session, which is quite nice, we have the chance to actually have you ask directly, unlike the other sessions earlier this summit. And so if you have a question, please use the Zoom feature to raise your hand or drop it in the chat channel if you'd like. In fact, I see Uriel, you have a question. Maybe you could ask Nicholas. Yeah, thank you. So hi, and thank you for your time. Uh, I was wondering, Google Glass, it was, it was a project from Google which was um, that follow this process, which what th they thought they were creating the future of eye wearing and uh, it did not succeed. And I just wanted to ask you, Nicolas, in your experience, when products fail, many, a lot of money uh, is lost, but how do you keep going or how do you make profit out, out of your losses? Well, I mean, thanks for the, the question. I think it's a uh, Google Glass, uh, it's a really interesting case. Uh, there are several, I mean, several things that I could reply on. The, 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 the first thing is that I would not say that it's a similar kind of process because my impression from what I've read about, uh, about Google Glass is that they, they started from a very strong hypothesis about hardware and about like cameras in the, in the, in the device. And I, I would say they were, uh, the stents were like probably too confident about, about how this would change. And, and they jump almost directly to like prototyping the, the thing. And, and, and also inspired by like, uh, like science fiction and their elements in the, in the Google Glass, uh, like motherboard that is like some kind of um, connection to Dragon Ball and, and, and Japanese uh, anime, which is kind of funny. But I, I, to me, like what, what I've presented is, there's a big difference in the way that what we try to, to use as weak signals are like a mix of, I would say, positive and, and, and problematic elements. We're not trying to um, show that, like, that everything will go well. We tend to have this rule that we call the 70, 20, 10 rule. 
uh, which is like the, the percentage of ingredients that we put in our design fiction that are like positive or problematic. Like 70% is normal, I mean, technology works. 20%, there's some frictions about things. And 10%, total catastrophe. Like if you take the, the IKEA catalog, there are certain things where you as a reader, you would see that you're like, no, no this, this will never work. Uh, something in the toilet or some network product. I, would, I, don't, I don't want this to happen. And by using this kind of like, um, I mean, in, in, in strategic foresight, in general, you have multiple scenarios and some are more diverse than others. Some are more positive than others. It's a way to create an object that you're not, I mean, you're not prescriptive prescriptive in the sense that you're not sure about how things may happen, but it will eventually create a discussion and a debate about the possibilities. And the, the problem I have with uh, like Google Glass is that it seems that there was just one scenario like this, it should be this way, it should be like that. And they put a lot of money into it. And there's a great piece in the New Yorker that analyzed uh, after a few years what, what happened. And, and you, you read this, you're like, no way. They created, they had just one scenario. No one scenario about the future of this device. And to, to me, that, that's where the, the, the problem is because, and that's probably an, like, like very common in, in uh, I mean, in, in business, in general product fails. The, the, the percentage of product failure is huge, but what you don't want to happen is to spend too much money uh, failing. And I do think that what I've presented before, and we're not the only studio working on this, well, it's a way to understand that this multiplicity of possibility can be considered a bit longer than just focusing on one scenario and by trying to, to fail with only like cardboard or like visual representations of things that are presented here is a way to probably like set different priorities and, and change and adjust the path. So, that, I mean, overconfidence is not necessarily a, like a good companion when you do this kind of feature. Thank you. I have a question. Well, actually, does anyone else have a question? No worries. Nicholas, we had talked about this before the session started. And actually, I haven't heard your story about this. So I thought I would ask everyone or in front of everyone here. How did you get into this line of work? Yeah, that's a, I mean, it's a, it's a funny question because my, my background was, I mean, uh, was not necessarily on this. I, I graduated from, uh, like, uh, at the time, doing my PhD in computer science. I, I was more interested in the human computer, human machine side of it. And, and it, it's funny how I followed different classes with, like with Bill, for instance, cocaine, if you are a partner about foresight. I, I worked as a consultant with companies uh, on play testing video games. And at some point, it's as if a lot of people close to me were working on strategic foresight. And I figured that it would be interesting to uh, combine the skills like human computer interaction, design skills, and my interest in science fiction in doing something that could be useful. Uh, and, and at the time, it was like the meet uh, like around 2005, 2006, a lot of people were starting blogs online and I started blogging about this and I started making friends on the other side of the planet. And, and a good friend of mine now, Julian Bleeker in California was working exactly on this. And we started working together. And eventually at the time we did not call that design fiction, but we started like trying to craft, to build our own craft uh, uh, in between design, foresight, and technology and cultures so that we can create objects that would be useful for the client we were working on. So yeah, it's basically creating one's job. I think that's so interesting. And it's a good reminder to the future isn't set. So for folks here who are stressing about graduation or what they're going to do next in their career, you could easily stumble into good opportunities or like Nicholas, I think, create your own path and keep reinventing that next step. So Nicholas, I know it can be tricky to share projects, particularly with companies and organizations where it's early stage or it's proprietary information. But I'm wondering if you can share generally, do you have any favorite projects or any projects that were particularly controversial given that you are 
provoking new thinking about near future ideas and implications? Um, yeah, I mean, without giving uh, too, uh, too many details about it, I, I, I have, um, I mean, most of the projects we work on are about digital technologies, but as you may know, it's sometimes it's a bit hard to find where it stops. And, and with biotechnologies and uh, sort of bio slash digital technologies that exist around, for instance, um, like the equivalent of 3D printers, but for uh, things you can eat or things you can build tissue with. We, uh, we did a project with uh, like a, a French uh, client and, and this, I mean, it's, it's funny. Uh, I, will, I mean, I, probably I, I, I did not realize that before, but I realized that creating this kind of design fiction artifact about something that is related to the human body uh, like implants, like like growing uh, skin, would be would be super controversial and and would spark reaction that would I mean of course we we knew a little bit uh, that it could be problematic and we intentionally created things to generate a certain kind of debate about certifications regulations uh, ethical problems. But I, yeah, I realized that for some people, it was absolutely, it was even more than controversial. It was something that we should not talk about or, and, and that, that, I mean, it's probably, um, I mean, eventually we talked about it, but, but that's probably why, I mean, it's interesting to, to work with this kind of speculative design and design fiction practice, because you, literally, you give flesh to the things, you, 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 you create objects that make, change tangible understandable and and i mean if, if you talk about artificial intelligence a lot of people will think about science fiction so if you in science fiction stories and certain kind of movies so by creating this kind of equivalent with like very basic artifact is a way to engage people and in, in a way to, to engage them with certain emotions and 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 affects that um Yes, so sometimes for some people, it's uh, they, they, they think it's real. They, they, I mean, one of the another project we work on um, about uh, bio hackerspace. The client was convinced that what we presented was true. It was it was not like in the future. We, the client thought it, it existed, and and we have to know it's it's a, it's a scenario. It's it's not happening, and right. and. So, I mean, these kind of stories are, are interesting because it's sometimes it becomes so convincing when it's represented uh, on a boring piece of paper or uh, with videos that are so close to everyday life that uh, it has drawbacks. It can be, people can feel too emotional about it. Well, it gets, I think, to that whole, it's the human psychology. Yes, you're exploring questions that have nearer term impact and it's not quite real, but it's grounded in evidence and yeah. people I think can start to project their wishes, their fears, their business concerns onto these areas. And then how do you help separate that? How do you help reassure? Uh, does concepts of fear and risk come up or how do you manage that aspect too? Because there's emotion that's embedded in these business conversations. Uh, clearly, clearly, I mean, fear, risk. I mean, also for certain kind of people, it's uh, like uh, enthusiasm and, and being so, too positive about certain change. And 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 here, yeah, I mean, probably that's something we learned over time is to um, find ways in not being too. Um, I mean, the, the point of, to say differently, the, the point of this, the point of creating this artifact is to help people react in the present or in like a few years uh, ahead. So we don't want to scare people too much or we don't want to make people too emotional as well. Hence, this kind of rule that we use, the 70-20-10 rule that, that says that in scenarios, there should be a mix of business as usual, catastrophic things and, and friction. So that it's not too scary because I mean, a lot of colleagues in the in speculative design tend to produce a uh, very dystopian kind of futures. And some companies are creating two like kind of utopian futures where everything works well and you see some promotional videos and you're like, okay, this is not gonna happen. Uh, and what we try to do is to be in between, not too utopian and not too dystopian. Too utopian means 
it's too easy and it's uh, naive. Too dystopian, it's, it's uh, I mean, people will uh, be blocked by that. Not, nothing will, it's not gonna be useful. So we try to find that some kind of intermediary uh, uh, posture, position for, for the design fiction. Interesting. It's good to hear too, how you can balance the imagination with the reality in these conversations mm. that you're having, very much so. Questions from our small group here or thoughts or comments? There's another one, there's another one from Uwe. Yeah, so I just wanted to ask from all the projects you've seen that have not been made, have you seen one that you yourself would like to to make it through uh, to to actually uh, take it to the world if you even if you had to leave what you're doing right now like I really believe in this that that hasn't come out well one thing that I'm fascinated with uh, like in the, I've been fascinated with in the last five years or seven years is how digital uh, the sort of digital revolution can be can be less harmful for the planet and I I mean I'm fascinated by object that lasts I mean if you think about like uh, cooking ware or if you think about certain clothes that exist but what would be a computer that lasts 10 years or 15 years and what would be an operating system that, that could work in 15 years and that's I mean there, there were projects about computers that could be quite robust like if the one one uh, laptop per child X01 project, but it was probably done in a different um, with a different kind of perspective, and probably a bit problematic as well. But I'm I find that kind of uh, target interesting, and and the many projects I've seen fail for different reasons, and of course it depends on the infrastructure and depends on the environment. Uh, but I, that, that's something I. I yeah, I'm quite fascinated with because it's needed and also because it's an interesting uh, societal design and engineering uh, challenge. Thank you. And I realize we're at time. I hope for folks here and we'll have students later listening to the recording of this talk will appreciate learning a bit more about the world of design fiction. So thank you again, Nicholas Nova. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you all. This is Thank the end you. of the session. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.